Resolution 1325 came out of the women's movement. What it stands for is ensuring that women um, can participate in decision making around peace, protecting women in situations uh, of war, uh, having uh, attention for their vulnerabilities, and also prosecution of war crimes against women, ensuring that there's no impunity. During Beijing in 1995, women really stated that women have a role to play in conflict resolution and women are also affected by conflict and war in specific ways. Women in the field have informed us that the empowerment benefited them greatly, but they still felt that there was lack of male support or lack of traditional male structures really changing. I think this is where we come full circle. This is where we start with women raising their voices, saying we're part of this world and please, your, your peace building will be more successful if you involve the other half. They are the ones who started the movement for gender justice. So if men have to come in, if anything, their first port of call is to learn from the women who have been in this movement for quite some time. The paradigms, the models of being a man are so often resting on images of being a soldier, of being the one who is willing to kill in the service of protection, and the one who is, being, who is willing to die in the service of the, our, uh, our country. If you train men, if you involve a lot more men in this kind of work, will have a much greater impact. And men can still help to reduce violence. Even though we are always seen as the perpetrators of violence, we can change that and we can let men see that really you can be part of the movement to end violence in the world today. Yes. When it comes to the women movement in Liberia, that's the Women Mass Action for Peace. It's so unique that those of us that work along with them, we, we try to understand what really happened. What they did was to put pressure on the stakeholders, those that were key to the crisis. The women started their campaign by ne negotiating. They had a group, a team, they were responsible for negotiation and they had a pressure group. Now that we've gotten this peace that we yearn for, how do we sustain the peace? Now is the women focus. How do we sustain this peace? We cannot sustain the peace when we have our men who have been in combat for 17 years, who have been socialized into this violent or patriarchy society. If we don't work with them, we find ourselves going back through the process of every time putting pressure or dealing with crisis. But how can we prevent the crisis? To prevent the crisis, we have to get the men on board to understand the language we understand. Because if we understand peace and they don't understand peace, there will be no peace. The joy of it for men is that they don't have to be the traditional kind of man all the time. They also can be, they can have their hearts open to other emotions, other ways of being, other creative, spontaneous ways, other forms of leadership. So it's very much releasing men from the bondage of these horrific, violent roles that are just automatically given to men and men don't have an opportunity to, to have a choice. They're not just one role in their life. They are a man, a spiritual man, uh, an actively nonviolent man, a student, a teacher, a religious leader, a brother, a son, a father, a friend, a lover. So I've been looking at this full role repertoire so that they can begin to have choices. We started with some action exercises where they looked at their feelings 
and what it is to be a gender sensitive, active, nonviolent man. Men and women. Military. Men and violence. Masculinity. Men and violence. Hatred. Hatred. Men and violence. Dominance. So it internally it feels me that uh, more men are doing more violence, so that's why my my <laughs> wife went up. Men and violence. Men and violence. <laughs> <laughs> um, think, think more. A man was described in terms of, of how much he was domineering, which meant that some men were even more manly than others. The nice thing about psychodrama is it relies very much on role theory as a way of looking at personality and development and these men are really developing new roles for themselves. I want to work on dealing with the traditional issues that have promoted uh, violent masculinity over the years and knowing that these issues are deeply embedded in religious beliefs. So what's the entry point for me and how how can I also manifest my principles as a gender-sensitive, active, non-violent man That's good. in that community and be respected and also be able to work with the community? The psychodrama director would often take your hand and we would begin what we call the walk and talk, right? We need to get uh, characters. You are talking really slow a bit of who could play uh, the role of traditional leaders. What else? Um, I think we can also have religious leaders, we can have women as well, we can also have a group of observers because that is where it's been handed on. One of the things I'm sensing is that you have something that you want to say to the chief and that you can say in psychodrama anything that you want to say, you may not be able to say it at home, but the belief is if you say it here, you might be able to say something at home. I rely on you because most people believe in whatever you say. So can we uh, work together and promote the right of women and also make sure that they are respected in society? So what we do in psychodrama is we reverse roles. You become Ali Wu, okay, and come on up and take his place and you become the chief because this is about Ali Wu's reality. It's not about the group reality. It's not about how this would be in other circumstances. So sit down and do it again. I know we, we work with women. They are there, but like the way you say, it's, it's not what we are used to do. But let's see, uh, bring the women in. We want to listen to what we are going to say and to what they are going to say. You know the young boys. Once you give them that authority, they are going to, they are going to misbehave. They, even, they might even rape the women. So I want you as the chief and the other elders in this community to consider this decision and also call the girls, let them be present in these meetings. If we are talking about them, let them be there. If there is a concern, let them be there. Let us hear what they will say. So that is my opinion. Uh, during the, the psychodrama, I felt inside the fear of the women. Women are always in the back. Of, of the circle, so men have to discuss on and decide on behalf of women. So, through the this this practice, really, I'm learning enough things. Now that I have been trained, I'm going to train other people who will understand the issues the way I understand them, who will uh, work with me and support me as allies. And together, we we'll then see how we can expand the network and work with more men. I learned from this training on, the, on uh, giving space for women, and listening to them, and don't speak in behalf of the women. You tie twice, huh? One, two. Two. Then you untie. And then you pass it on to the next one. And he does basically the same thing. <laughs>
For the last seven years, I am working in Pakistan with policemen. So I, I really feel like a institution like police, which is, which is very macho, which is very masculine, if they are sensitive, they are going to deal in a better way to the survivor of victims of violence. I think this is the first uh, a sort of contribution we as a civil society person can make for the, uh, for, uh, for the police. Gender equality. It's something like personal. It's like you, you See you. transformation. Yeah. You transform yourself. Yeah. When we get together, even as a group of men, we invite women from the community where we are meeting to sit with us and engage in a dialogue together because it's important for us to hear the voices of women and we understand that it's also important for women to have an opportunity to ask questions and hear the voices of men. How many men in your country think and feel the way you do about this particular issue? To my knowledge, if I calculate men that I know, and I can see there are 40 men in the state of Maharashtra in India. So it's very difficult, it's very less number, but we certainly can say that those men with whom I personally have interactions and who are with me in that state of Maharashtra where I work, you know, I could see those 40 men. There are like around 20, 25 people like me trying to change. I was at a, a conference for the launch of a research document on violence against women in Belfast uh, earlier this year and the number of men who were attending was less than, you know, out of 40 or 50 people there, maybe there were three, four, five men and after the break there was only one. So the situation is, is, is similar unfortunately I think in Europe as well. There are a lot of men in Liberia but what they need is the opportunity. And I think I could be an opportunity for their change. What is the image of a gender sensitive man that you as women have? He can express his emotion, he can cry. <laughs> it's, it's equal decision making, it's uh, taking everybody's wishes and, and wants in the partnership as equal and then trying to balance that and trying to bring it together. I think um, it takes strength for a man to be able to, to see other people's vulnerabilities and be vulnerable himself. And I think when you have empathy with other people, um, and you have empathy with yourself, you can really be a real strong person. What does empower, empowerment mean for you? For me, empowerment is choice. That's, that's the basis of empowerment, it's choice. Being in the woman's shoes and seeing through her eyes and seeing her as an agent of change. A person with dignity. If I am treated with dignity, then that's empowerment for me. Every woman is equal in every decision we make. I think what made it uh, successful was the the ability to, to really listen, particularly for the men, which is a very difficult thing for men to do, to sit and to listen to women talk. The tool of cross-gender dialogue allows women to speak and lets the men sit down and listen, which is a very difficult thing for men to do in my cultural context. In the garden, the maker had many trees and the bamboo was the most beautiful tree and it made the maker so happy because the bamboo grew so tall it reached the heavens but one day the maker said i'm going to cut you down 
and the bamboo's heart is broken. Why cut me down? Didn't I make you happy? Didn't I please you? The maker said, I have to cut you down. And so, because it was just a creation of the maker, the bamboo had no choice. It was cut down. And when it was cut down, it was split in the middle. From the stream, the bamboo caught the water and brought it to the people. And then the bamboo felt very happy because it was so useful. It promoted life for the people. I just felt that the question, the last question, the way the men answered, what about the men? Where will you find yourself? Well, the bamboo is so beautiful, it pleased God. But when it split, it was not the same bamboo that was so graceful. And Yes. 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 Militarism is the ultimate expression of masculinity. It's the role or the institute where being dominant, using extreme violence to settle difference, um, not showing emotions, being tough, following the leader, is um, projected into the extreme and for a lot of men when conflict breaks out there are huge pressures in terms of joining the military or joining militarist groups it's either you're with us or you're against us if you're not with us you're not a real man a real man stands up and defends his community women go through a lot in terms of violence and it has become a norm to the extent that None of us sees that as a problem. We see it as something normal. And so when my eyes, because sometimes it needs somebody to open your eyes for you to see things differently. That's actually what happened to me. That I saw things differently. I looked back and saw these women really suffering from the brunt of war in their homes, in the communities, because of religious structures, because of traditional ways of doing things. During the course of our training, we got to understand the link between masculinity and militarism, whereby we realized that men are socialized to think that a real man has got to fight, a real man has got to kill. Even in media, they portray this um, this macho type of man, the GI Joe, who who does not think who's immune. They d display the Terminator, who's supposed to kill. So a man, a real man, is destroyed, is, is portrayed as a killer. A man who can take away life. They want to help, but they don't just know how to do it. And so as part of the process, we help them to learn it. Because some of the women are afraid they will not teach the men how to do it. I train men and boys on issues of gender, men, masculinities, violence against women, and sexuality. And we also talk about militarization and uh, nationalism and chauvinistic ideas about state and nation uh, in South Asia because you know my context is very much in South Asia and uh, conflicts cross-border tensions between India and Pakistan Go on, just shoot ideas, shoot them, like just put them out and pedagogy to a degree is based on uh, programming and peace building where you look at the problem, you look at the actors, you look at who you are I have strong belief that if I do not reflect on myself, on my own attitudes, on my own behaviors, I can't be able to really uh, help relate or connect to other people. We are socialized in a way that promotes violence. It's very important for me because I now have uh, an attitude of questioning anything. So not anything that I'm told, I have to know why and what for and who does it benefit. So that's helping me to be very critical in my analysis, in looking at tradition, in looking at religion, in looking at society at large. A perfect example is myself, one person who have moved from violent ways of life into non-violence and actually become a role model to other people. When I first came into contact with active non-violence, I was a very violent person. The way I would respond to situations would be very quickly fights to resolve conflict, I, you, I would uh, respond to people rudely when I, I feel I can't answer their questions as a way of 
remaining in that cage of violence, which then worked for me. But I came later on to realize that I responded in that way because I had no any other way that I knew. The next level is education of the one who is causing the injustice and then making them see how they are also losing out. And this is where we're coming full circle now. We have to deconstruct those images and we have to understand that they have been used in the service of maintaining a, a systems of structural and institutional and international violence that we are being sacrificed for. We as human beings are being sacrificed. And so when we can understand that, we can start to find our, our true power, which is to stand separate from those things, and that we can start to be agents of change. These 19 men who have come together from different parts of the world, and thanks to WPP for the vision to, 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 to realize that you can continue training women in this area, but women will always go against the wall because men in traditional societies are always the powerful people, are always the ones who are recognizing this. So, in a way, WPP, in bringing men together for the first time and from 17 countries in the world, is actually creating a new model. We believe we have now a strong community of men out there who already have worked with women and who can really demonstrate how men can be allies to women in their peace work. It's going to be very tough because men benefit through violence, men benefit from the positions, the power, the resources they enjoy in the communities. But I believe it is possible. We can always change people. If we will learn to respect the right of others, then we are able to live at peace.